Welcome to this edition of Access Together. These shows are made possible through the combined efforts of Shelby County Schools and GHS-TV. The shows are hosted by the members of the community and utilize the staff and facilities of Germantown High School. If you would like to watch our live stream or get more information about these shows, log on to our website, ghstv.org. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the following presentation. Welcome to Inspiring Leaders. I'm Donna Chandler Newman, your host for our show, and thank you for watching our program. Through this show, we meet community leaders and we examine how they're using their unique talents and skill sets to make a difference. And through our discussions, we hope to inspire others to discover and to share their own leadership abilities for the overall betterment of our community. Now, today's show is about an organization that has provided aid to the sick, the poor, the aged, and the marginalized for over 40 years. This group started small, and at first they worked solely with our neighbors in Fayette County, but today their reach is far larger in geography, and in particularly in the number of families served. Project Outreach is the name of the organization, and I believe that you'll be inspired by the work they do and the lives that they have changed in our community. In this first portion of our show, We'll meet Shauna Moore, Executive Director of Project Outreach, and in the second segment of our show, Shauna and I will be joined by Danielle Henley, a member of the Board of Directors for Project Outreach. Joining us now, Shauna Moore, Executive Director and President of the Board of Project Outreach. Welcome, Shauna. Thank you so much, Donna, and thank you for sticking with Project Outreach through the years. I oh, know you've been aware of us. I'm very aware and actually a donor and proud to be uh, involved with your cause. Thank and so you. I'm proud to feature you all today as well. You've um, had some things that you do the same, some things you do differently, and many things you do bigger and better than ever before. So thank we'll you. talk about those today. Sure. But first, let's start with you. Um, what's your background, Shona, and how did you first become involved with Project Outreach? Well, my husband and I and our sons moved to Germantown 30 years ago. Uh, the, the kids went through Germantown schools, and uh, I was the music director at Our Lady of Perpetual Help, and that's really my background field is music. Um, I was in between jobs when Sister Elaine approached me about going to Fayette County with her just to see how things went. And uh, at that time, she was dying with cancer. Oh. She had gone through treatment with breast cancer, and uh, it, it had returned, and she knew she was close to the end. And so she said, Shona, will you work with us? And you said? Well, look, my answer is, what, what do you say to a dying nun? <laughs> and you say, yes, sister. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Catholic schools, too, I know. So um, I'm glad that you did, and the people in Project Outreach are very glad that you did as well. So um, they're very glad you stepped up to it. Now, there's a rich history behind Project Outreach. You mentioned Sister Elaine a minute ago. Yes. Talk about the history and how the project came about. Well, when this diocese was first organized, our first bishop was Carol Dozier, mm -hmm. and he was quite a fellow, very aware of social justice, mm -hmm. and uh, well-liked, and did a lot for our diocese that still makes a difference. But one thing that he realized was there was not a medical facility in the next county, which is Fayette County, mm -hmm. and people were coming from uh, 40 and 50 miles away and when you're in labor, that's not a good thing. No, no. <laughs> but it's a, a lot of emergencies and a, a, a long travel time to see a doctor in Memphis. And so she started a health clinic. She did. He he called on the Franciscans of Rochester, Minnesota, to come and help with that to help get funding. Uh, they knew a lot about building medical facilities because uh, uh, before 1900, they helped build the Mayo Clinic. Really? They did. They did. They had already built a little hospital that would handle less than 20 people. And the Mayos, the father was 70 and his two boys were in their 20s. And they were helping with post-Civil War treatment of uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they happened to be in that area. And the sisters pulled them in to help at their clinic. And it just grew from there. They actually told the Mayo boys that it was time to build a hospital. 
Well, that's terrific for <laughs> the entire United States and, and, and the world for the Mayo Clinic, but very particularly for Fayette County for yes. the clinic that she put together. It is. And that's what, how many years ago? Oh, that was in, in the se late 70s. But she didn't stop there. What did she do after the health clinic? Well, she, re she stayed on for a while as an employee there, so to speak, not paid. Yeah. And uh, fell in love with some of the families. When she knew they had medical problems, she would go home with them and make sure everything was done properly with care of whatever injury or illness might come up. She was in their homes when their children were born and she was there when grandmother passed away uh -huh. and just en endeared herself to this community in a way that can't be matched by anyone. And in fact there's a park for her. And, there is. And that's uh, part of where you all meet. But let's go back a minute. When, um, when she did this and she went into people's homes she saw a great need, right? Oh, exactly. And that's when she put together the Project Outreach. So what would you say is the mission of Project Outreach? Well, it, it built slowly, of course. The, the main thing is always food, mm -hmm. you know, just enough food. And it's a very rural community without many stores. And back in that day, very few places to buy food, mm -hmm. uh, which makes the food very expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, she saw that need. and and talked with some of her friends in Memphis and got supporters together from lots of different churches. She was uh, at their meetings. When, if the men's club met, she was there. If the women met, she was there. And she built those relationships that still, still sustain us. Today, Yes, right? yes. So um, your mission is to provide for the physical, the um, the food, the uh, clothing, and some shelter? Is that that's, pretty much? That's a good, good way to put it, yes. Okay, and the <laughs> physical needs of those people. Yes. Um, so tell us about what services and how you actually go about fulfilling that. Well, f we feel food comes first. Our uh -huh. objective, in anyone's, would be to help people get out of that, the situation they're in. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, you know, you, you don't want to split up families yeah. It, that, that's not our objective, to have someone move into town. Mm -hmm. But we do know that in order for the children to do better in school, they need better nutrition. Mm -hmm. And we start with that at conception. If we hear a young lady is pregnant, um, we, we try to get the needs that she has mm -hmm. to start building a healthier baby from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then if, if the kids go to school hungry, they don't learn very well and it irritates the heck out of the teachers. <laughs> I bet it does. <laughs> and it's really hard to, um, to learn if your stomach is empty. It is. Yeah. It's hard to sleep, too. Yes, it and is. That, and that happens. A lot of children do go to bed without enough food. One of the other things that you mentioned to me has to do with clothing, and so it's hard to go to school when you're cold. Doesn't, who does, takes care of the coats, though? Well, we have volunteers now who are really interested in coats, and some people I guess you would say specialize in gathering coats. Uh -huh. And it's the same way with other things, with school supplies and that sort of thing. Um, okay. Certain times of the year, more people are active with us because they're interested in that particular uh, thing that we're gathering. So um, I know that for the longest time, I thought that Project Outreach all centered around the holidays, specifically Christmas, because I do remember writing the bigger checks then and, and giving clothes and everything else that you needed, brooms, mops, the crazy things I thought, but yeah. I didn't realize how needed they were. So, but it's not just the holidays. What do you all do year round? Well, we take food at least once a month uh -huh. and generally to 60 to 80, sometimes 100 families a month. Wow. And they get, uh, Kroger donates bags to us, they're brown paper bags and we double them and stuff them just as full as we can get them. That's a and usually there's a roll of toilet paper right on top. Well, also needed, right? It's like a candle, you know, let's <laughs> celebrate we have this. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, got it. <laughs> Didn't you tell me that this month is soup month? It is. is we right? always do that in January. Uh -huh. We and encourage Everyone, and, and my husband even encourages me to make a big pot of soup <laughs> What do you do in cold. February? Uh, it's, a, it's pretty much of a mix in February. Uh -huh. We still try to have things for cold weather. You know what feels better. 
uh, in cold weather. Well, and some of our Februarys are cold and some yeah, are not. That's right. Yeah, so gotcha. Gotcha on that. So uh, you're bringing food, you're bringing clothes. Yes. Talk to me about how this works. Um, do you like suddenly one day decide it's time to go? How do the people know you're coming? How does it work? Well, we have a list and, and we know everyone who comes to us and we know their financial situations um, to a certain extent. There are always circumstances that put someone in trouble financially that we don't know about and we try to respond also to that. Uh -huh. But uh, generally, we, I have a volunteer. Uh, if I think we can get together enough food for 60 families, I'll call this lady who lives in the community. And mm -hmm. if she knows of special needs, uh, she calls those people first. And then mm -hmm. we just kind of rotate and try to go to families that have the most need and also the most children. And where do you get the food? Oh, it just comes, it shows up on my front door. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that's not so. No, it's the garage door. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you do get it we, from? From a number of churches that have pantries uh -huh. and a number of schools who have uh, different fundraisers, food raisers mm -hmm. during the year, and, and do, we are the recipients of that. Uh -huh. So um, that's where you get it, and so you you need lots more food, I'm sure. You, we could not have enough food. There's just not a way. And you also need volunteers, correct? We do. All right. We do. And uh, we meet in Collierville at the uh -huh. Walmart uh -huh. early in the morning, and we convoy out. Sometimes there are 10 cars and sometimes 30. Uh -huh. And um, when we get there, we have a pantry that's part of our pavilion and we take everything out of our cars and out of the bags and stock the shelves just like a grocery store mm -hmm. so we can pretty equally divide what we have. Good, that sounds good. So um, you are providing food, you also bring clothing, We correct? do. Okay, so. We, we do accept used, used clothing most of the year. Uh -huh. At Christmas, we only do new things mm -hmm. with, with the exception of coats and, you know, we love to provide warmth, and and this year especially, it got so cold right after Christmas that uh, we kind of reveled in it for a while, thinking <laughs> that people have coats on, Thank goodness, and we yeah. give uh, we give blankets away every year. So you know, it's a, it's a project that you feel immediately a success, but also we're building the the biggest thing is to educate young people. Uh huh. And that, this is just all, that is the final dream for us. And, and it's going very well. We see a lot more children finishing high school and a number of people going to college and we've got a lot of college graduates. We, we have a young man who's teaching in the community who came through our program, so we're really proud of him. So the benefits are very tangible and they're evident, um, and, but the need is still very great. Well, right. that's just not going away. Uh -huh. You know, jobs are hard to get, and they are a long way from any job. You have to have a good car to be dependable. That's and true. And when you're going 40 miles every day, well, none of our cars mm -hmm. can, can be sure of going 40 miles every day. That's true. Uh, that's a problem. Well, um, we're going to talk a little more about how you fund this organization okay. in a few moments. But um, for now, uh, I want to thank you for what you're doing for our community. Thank you so much. Stay it, with it me. It is truly a pleasure. Stay with me. We're going to pause now for a short break, and when we return, Sean and I will be joined by Danielle Henley, a board member for Project Outreach. Hello, and welcome to Cable Quiz. Do you know how incredible it is to work at a TV station in high school? GHS TV is a student-run television station. There's so many things you can do here at GHS TV. You can be in front or behind the camera or both. You have that opportunity. There are no limits. Well, we have sports and we have news and we have entertainment. So the students here get a well-rounded view of what it's like to be in the TV field. It's my life. It's what I want to do. From all of us here at GHS TV, Thanks for starting your morning with us. For more information about the Kappa program, visit GHSKappa.com or call 755-7775. 
You're watching the award-winning GHS-TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back. We're pleased to continue talking with Shauna Moore, Executive Director and President of the Board of Directors of Project Outreach, and to meet Danielle Henley, Board Member for their organization. Thank you all both for being here. You're most welcome. And welcome, Danielle. Thank you. It's good to meet you, and I, I know that you've been involved with Project Outreach for a little while. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about your background right now and how you become involved with the project. Okay. Why are you so passionate about it? Okay. Well, I grew up in Fayette County in Moscow, the community that Project Outreach heavily serves. And growing up, I reaped the benefits of Project Outreach. My grandmother helped raise me. I come from a single parent household. And so she helped raise me and three other grandchildren. And so we didn't have much, but we made do with what we had. And um, I went to college and um, I was a first generation college student. I graduated with my bachelor's in biology and later went on to graduate with my doctor of pharmacy from the University of Tennessee. And I currently work as a pharmacist in retail pharmacy. Well, that's fabulous. I mean, so you've basically come a very, very long way from where you began. Yes, ma'am, I did, with the help of my family and Project Outreach. Yeah. Talk about Project Outreach. What kind of impact did it make on you? Well, growing up, uh, like I said, we didn't have much, but just having that extra support from somebody outside of your family, uh, being able to start school with school supplies, having everything you need, it just gives you that extra boost of confidence to do, you know, put your mind to whatever you want to do. And also through college, you know, they helped out with book scholarships and we all know books are very expensive. And so it was just a great uh, support system behind me that I had. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned to me when we spoke previously, you said there wasn't a grocery store within eight to 10 miles, right? Right, right. I would consider uh, much of Fayette County a food desert. You have to drive pretty far to get food, and, and as Shona said, some of the food is really, the prices are m more expensive than you would spend in a city. Uh -huh. And so it's just, it's really hard to get access to food and even harder to get uh, healthy, healthy fruits and vegetables, I would say. So when I think about that entire cycle, um, you can't be educated if your stomach's not full. You mm -hmm. can't get food if somebody doesn't help you or if you don't have a car right. to go get something because you don't walk eight to 10 miles for a gallon of milk, right? Mm -hmm. I guess you would do if you have to, but, uh, and you need a car also for a job, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Need, I mean, this is a complete cycle. So when you go in to, with Project Outreach, you're actually looking at an entire family. You're looking holistically instead of just piece parts, is that right? Exactly. Right. It's definitely more than just food that the communi community benefits from. Uh -huh. And Project Outreach provides a lot of that as well, as far as uh, the warm coats and the school supplies and just having somebody there to ask you, how did you do on your report card? And just giving you that extra boost. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't even address school supplies before. Mm -hmm. I know that because I've been involved in that before. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I didn't mention before, this is also not a Catholic ministry, though it sounded like one a minute ago. It is non-denominational. Isn't that right? Then that will, that will remain. We, that's who we are. Yeah. I mean, there have been, um, even with the founding of it, there were several other uh, Presbyterian churches, oh, yes. et cetera, involved in it. We're, we're just in love with Germantown Presbyterian for all <laughs> that they do for us. I spoke with their women's. Uh, leadership this morning. Yeah, they're they're terrifically giving as is Farmington. Yes, um, they are as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Farmington Presbyterian. Yes. So, uh, and the schools. Um, but as we think about this, and as um, as you guys address the needs, um, how do you decide where to start? I mean, it, it, there's just so many and so much. Mm -hmm. Do you guys ever feel overwhelmed? I do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I'm uh, just switching over to the, the volunteer side, so I'm not as well versed in this as Shona is, but I know it is very overwhelming for her and everybody else involved. Uh -huh. we, we have highs and lows, uh -huh. and there have been days that uh, uh, for some reason the heat uh, affects me 
and there have been days we've been out working when we were in a small building and it was 106 mm -hmm. and I go and get in my air-conditioned car and drive home and change into my swimsuit and get in my swimming pool. And feel blessed to have one. <laughs> no, I, I fall apart. Yeah. I feel, I, it's not guilt, it's, uh, and I know we're not all going to be equal. I, I do feel totally blessed and cared for. Mm -hmm. But it's all, there's also a why me and why someone else is hungry and hot. And you just, you grow in your appreciation, for right. sure. And gratitude. Right? Yes. Um, okay, so you guys go to the park, the, the Sister Elaine. Sister Elaine Wicks, Wicks Memorial Park. And then you go to the pavilion and you gather. I can easily see what you're giving because you've talked about it. Why does someone participate in this? What do you, what do you feel? I know you get a tax deduction, you get this, you get that, but there are three thousand uh, nonprofit organizations in our area. Why do people choose? Both of you are volunteers. Why mm -hmm. do people choose to become involved with this particular nonprofit? I think it's apparent that this community is underserved. Mm -hmm. If you're if you are in need in Memphis, there are a number of places to go. Uh, we have just lost the other 501c3 that served this area. Mm -hmm. Fayette Cares is a big help. They're in Somerville, which is, what, 20 minute drive mm -hmm. or so. Um, and it's even gotten more stressful to know that uh, the other organization is just not there anymore. We are, we are Alone. intent. Mm -hmm. on taking care of the need, but it is challenging. So you just picked up a bunch of new participants. If they can't cover them, they still need to be covered. They do. They do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned a nonprofit organization a minute ago. You guys have always been a nonprofit of some sort. You've always had that status, but now you're a standalone. We are. Nonprofit. You just got that designation this and past we, year. We are hoping that that makes us sustainable. And that's always the issue, isn't it? It is. Okay. You know, after 20 or 30 or 40 years of working it, I'm, uh, I've, I've been there 20 years. I don't want to stop until I can't get in the truck. Uh -huh. But someone has to do it. And mm -hmm. if we can provide the foundations for the next leadership, I think we have a better chance of being sustainable. So, um, why, so this is important to you for sustainability. It also enables you to raise funds differently, doesn't it? Well, that's what I'm told. We're learning. We're on ground one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know you, you have even you know, offered to me some suggestions of what we can do now, mm -hmm. and we'll get there. I know you we, will. I know we will, too. We have really just sent out an announcement letter that we exist about two months ago. Yeah, I saw. Uh, yeah, I received. I was very, very um, happy to see that because it, also, it opens the door for you to give events and to raise money from corporations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right now, most of your funds come from individuals, do they not? They surely do. We're, it, the people who are involved are repeats also, which we just love. They know what we're doing. They know no one takes anything out of what's donated. We don't have any paid volunteers. Mm -hmm. Even our attorney is a volunteer. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess I just told him that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> You're a volunteer. <laughs> no, it, it, you get hooked on this. Uh -huh. People go one or two times and they just become regulars. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So there's a lot of joy that your participants have. Oh, for have. sure. Yeah, a lot of hugs and grandmother's tears when mm -hmm. uh, when they come back and tell us that their child is doing well. You know, that's one of the things your organization seems to provide. Many organizations that I talk to, I'm able to give them money and I may, um, you know, I may give them an hour or two doing something. You actually give hands-on service to people. We do. What all do they do for you? Well, we have had people help rebuild houses and paint and put up plastic on windows and doors to hold the warmth in in the winter. A number of things along that line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of things are available to do. That's right. Right. So if you wanted to get in touch with you all, how would you do that? 
Well, we do have a website. Uh, it's it's pitiful right now, but we're working on it. <laughs> it's <laughs> under construction. It's under construction, and we have a Facebook page, uh -huh. and it's Project Outreach. We still say Project Outreach of Fayette County, uh -huh. although uh, what we have done in the last nine months is gone. To, we've changed that to Project Outreach Incorporated, and mm -hmm. we serve West Tennessee. Uh -huh. All of West that's good. You're doing as much as you can with West Tennessee. We are. Yeah, that's really good. So, um, looking at that and thinking about that, you have a number of success stories. One of them is obviously right here. Yes. Um, and we're very proud of you. And I know Thank that you've you. reached back to your community in so many ways. Tell me about another success story. Oh, I, I suppose my next favorite would be um, <laughs> a young lady, LaTanya, whose mother also worked with us, not her grandmother, but her mother. And she, she still works nights at Walmart and gets up, doesn't even go home, comes to us to volunteer after that sometime until one or two in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, LaTanya has finished college. She was able to do that with uh, loans in any way, any way she could, but she would work at FedEx at night and sleep in her car because it was too far to go home wow. and go to class the next morning and do her homework at some restaurant's table and she worked so hard and now she's um, she has a, a, a short time before she will do some professional work that's a part of her degree and then has two classes only two until she gets her PhD. Well, obviously you're changing lives. You're changing them one at a time and changing them in a very direct way. And I thank you all for what, I thank well, you for we, giving back. We and can't I thank claim you. success for that. Our <laughs> God has done that. That's true. Well, thank you all so much for being with us today. And thank you so much for telling us your story. Project okay. Outreach, projectoutreach.me. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us today for Inspiring Leaders. We appreciate our guests on today's show, Shauna Moore and Danielle Henley, both representing Project Outreach. If what you've heard on our program today has inspired you to learn more and to become involved with Project Outreach, then please visit their Facebook page, Project Outreach of Fayette County, or their website, projectoutreach.me. Now, if you're interested in the air dates of Inspiring Leaders or of any other show on our television station, you can visit ghstv.org where we're streaming live 24 hours a day. You can keep up with GHS TV by visiting our website. We hope you'll like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you again for joining us and be sure and watch our show, Inspiring Leaders, again next month.